Video games. And now the lighting effect. Hey. <laughs> So hello, my name is William Pugh. I design help for Stanley Parable, along with a guy in America called Baby Reed, and I'm here to talk to you about video games. My title was Do Not Come to This Talk. That is a test to make sure that you are of an adequate quality. So you know you're you're willing to work for things, you're not always gonna believe what people say, you're gonna work against what you know, every, everyone who's down there, you know, drinking coffee and having, you know, pleasant conversations, they're 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 below all of you. You've figured this out and you've passed the test, so let us begin. Video games are evolving like machines. Alright? I like machines. So, they used to be all about like point scoring back in the 90s, 80s. Some of you might remember them. I won't because I'm, I'm a little weak maybe. But, you know, uh, they were basically made to emulate sport or board, game, or board games or you know, stuff that we already understood when we came to like thinking, oh, interactivity. So, as Video games progress, you know, and we start to think, oh, maybe we can do stuff with these. Maybe we can use them to, to say something about art or about ourselves or about society. And, you know, maybe we can really it. Yeah. So, <laughs> this all makes sense. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's, it's been planned, this. It's, it's, yeah, you're, you're like shaking your head at the front. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. No. Yes. Oh, yes. what's your question? Oh, uh, how did the mechanics of Street Fighter work? How did the mechanics of Street Fighter, Street Fighter work? Well, basically, uh, they work by people pressing buttons, and then one of them won. It was basically a competition, and uh, we used video games to kind of, you know, see who was better at something. But they've evolved. Now we're starting to use them to tell stories, to mean things, to represent things, and that essentially means that we need to change our fundamental understanding of how we make them. So I'd like to say that nobody really understands how to make video games, especially this guy. Yeah? So, if we think about film and about TV, though that kind of way of making stuff has been around for about, about 100 years, I mean, back in the first 10 years, there was only black and white, and there was no kind of cuts. It was all static shots and people talking. They borrowed a lot of terminology from theatre because it was a new medium and they didn't understand it. Right? So, I like to propose that what we're doing is borrowing language and terminology from mediums that came before games. And we're applying them to games, like cutscenes, like, you know, text and stuff, and, and you know, non-interactive stuff. But games are interactive, you see. They're interactive. Just take that in for a minute. That's art. That's art. And that's money. That's art being exchanged for money. <laughs> So when we come to think about art, when we think about games as art, what does that mean? People like to talk about it. The Guardian newspapers now put games in the culture section, which is cool because it means we're hanging with the big boys, like painters and, and, and film people. But what does that mean for us and making money, right? So that's art. Uh, proper, I, I don't know what that is, but it's some kind of form of art. It's like, a, it'll be in a gallery somewhere, and there'll only be one of them, and that will probably go for about three, five million euro. And that's cool, because the person who painted that, they're, they're in the money. But when we, <laughs> when, when, uh, when we think about um, games as art, we don't think about it as like a single piece that a gallery can purchase, that a collector can purchase and then place in their homes or somewhere, they're inherently very easy to reproduce. And so a sense of uniqueness is kind of lost in that. I know that somebody, and I don't know who, and there's a point here for anyone who can tell me who did this. It was someone made the game and then put it on a laptop and then destroyed all of the connecting ports to that laptop. 
and then that game was a one in a kind product. Does anyone know who that was? Colin Northway. Say that again, louder. Colin Northway. Uh, it was that person. It's cool. It's <laughs> cool. But, um, but is that the answer? Is that how we start to approach our new understanding of, of what games can be now? Now that we've got people from different professions, different artistic mindsets coming and making things in this new space. So that's never in the story. It's kind of, uh, you, see, you see here the guy like, pulling the horse along. And I like to think that this is a metaphor, right? This is a metaphor. Now, this is why we need, this is why we needed to do the, the getting rid of the people who weren't willing to think, right? So so you're all gonna really look into this now. So the horse is like Mario Brothers or Pac-Man or mechanic space games. And that boy is the game's writer. Yeah? He's pulling it along. He's like, no, please. We could do so much together. And the horse is like, nah, but we need to think about shooting mechanics and getting feel. And the boy's like, no, no, this is up with, the time is now to start to make meaningful pieces of media that can express complex notions about society. And the horse is like, no, I want to shoot things, and I want the particle effects to look good, and I want the screen shape festival to happen so people, you know, feel good about shooting things in the game. And the boy's like, well, what do you want from me? I'm not like, do you want to make a project and then have me come on towards the end of development and, and try and piece all your bits together? And the horse is like, yeah, well, well, triple A's doing that and that's got the money and my way of doing things is low risk. And the boy's like, well, I'm going to go indie and I'm going to make my own experiences by using stuff like Unity and Twine. And then the horse says, yeah, but Twine's not really down really video games, like me. <laughs> and the boy says, well, maybe our understanding of video games and our definition of video games needs to change. And then the horse says, hashtag <sighs> game or something like that. So, <laughs> so this is a graph. It's nice, it's nice. And uh, these are robots, <laughs> pretty cool. And uh, so yeah, that's internet, that's cyberspace. And we do, all, we do all our work on it. And that's the separation between proper artistic mediums and games. Because I think that a lot of us do, not presuming, work by yourselves, I don't know, I do, and communicate with team members on Skype because that's just a cheaper way of doing things. Renting an office space, paying people salary is hard to do when you're trying to take risks with things and create a product that might not necessarily be financially viable. Probably work. What? Probably work. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's, it'll, it'll make sense. Because it's like theatre, and theatre links into games, right? It's like acts. It's saying something. We've got to work at this, alright? This isn't like... <laughs> so I made a game called The Stanley Parable, and that took about two years of development time. And... And I, I spent most of that time developing by myself. I didn't actually meet my uh, co-creator, Davey, until after the game was released. And um, a thing that I'm now going to talk about is my own kind of personal journey from the day of release of Stanley Parable until, uh, until kind of here and now, right? So it, this is all emotional stuff, it doesn't actually technically help anybody here, but it's a kind of a way for this to seem meaningful, and it seems like I'm exposing myself emotionally. And because I've explained that, that makes it then okay for me to do this now. So. Um, I go to Starbucks a lot now, right, because, you know, there's people in the same room as you when you're working. But I started, to go, I started going to Starbucks when, um, about three months after Stanley came out, I was quite depressed, I was quite sad, because what do you do after you've spent, like, three months crunching on a game and then it's out and there's no bugs and everything's gone as well as it possibly can? and you don't have anywhere to funnel that momentum. 
So I started um, thinking about well, what was the next project? What are we going to do next at the Stanley Program? It's gone so well. We're getting BAFTA nominations. We're getting uh, we're getting awards, winning in, in at, at the IGF and at loads of other festivals. And it's completely overwhelming. You feel like you need to justify yourself to the community, like prove yourself that that this one game wasn't a mistake, and you really are as brilliant as everybody's saying you are. And um, Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. So, um, so we spent a while kind of prototyping stuff, and we spent a while trying to figure out what would come next. And at the end of about three months, it was just after GDC, we kind of decided that uh, we don't really have anything. We don't have anything that we want to set down and, and start working for two years in isolation again to, to produce something like two years down the line that's like kind of like the Stanley Parable but uh, you don't know so so basically what happened was I uh, looked at my mentor Richard Griffiths and uh, Harry Potter number five he while he's talking to Petunia his wife about Harry and his son Dursley he says that boy is going young me all right. Now, if you actually look up the word Yonvi on, on Google, and you can find this, this is verifiably true, there is no actual definition of the word Yonvi. And this was something that I couldn't understand, right? It was hard for me to process it, all right? So I started asking, I thought maybe it was like colloquialism, maybe it was like a term used in a specific part of the UK or in the world, and so I started traveling about, and I started uh, you know, asking people like university professors who majored in like linguistics what what young he meant, and they all asked, they all said, we don't know. It's not it's not a word. There's no other recorded use of the word young in in history. And so then I um, and then just after I started my quest to find out what young was, uh, Richard Griffiths unfortunately died, and uh, the initial plan was that I would go to him and I would ask him, he said, Young P and Harry Potter 5, what, what does it mean? And, um, and, and then I just didn't have anywhere for that momentum to go. So, so then I, I thought, okay, that, that's not worked, so I'll, I'll make a team of game developers and I'll, I'll try working on weird independent projects that don't necessarily have any financial future because you know, it's the opportunity to do that. So I started uh, reaching out to different people. I reached out to Don. Don, say hello. Hi. I reached out to Jack. Jack, say hello. Hi. I reached out to Andrew Roper. Are you here? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he the talk. Well, he won't be around for very long. <laughs> so, um, so we started, you know, we started experimenting, we started making stuff in the industry, I started teaching myself how to do different things in, uh, I, I haven't worked in the industry before, so I started to teach myself how to do that, and I started to, you know, start to fill up my life again. But the problem was, I had an, an enemy, and that enemy was called Pat Ash. <laughs> Pat Ash, for some time, had, um, I've been quite envious of uh, my my unique kind of style, and he'd set about trying to spread a uh, rumor about me, and that was that I was an actor employed by him to pretend to be me. And, <laughs> and when I was asked to speak at Team Shape, I thought a lot about what I could speak about, and I think um, I figured out what I want to speak about. And it's that you should all know now that that isn't true. <laughs> I am William Q, I'm real, yet you can look this up. This is, again, verifiably true. And, and Pat's lying. <laughs> Pat is lying to you. <laughs> can you put the lights back on? Okay, hi. Right, so let's do questions now. What time are we on? What time are we on? Someone say. Five past. Five past? Twenty-five. Twenty-five past. Oh, yes! We've got loads of time for questions, so it doesn't look like I've just faffed about. Right, so, um, Hans, Hans, you moved. What? Yes, hello. Do you have a question? No, come on, you must. Why are you, why are you here at Screenshake? Listening. 
listening, what do you do? You make games. What kind of games do you make? You make different kinds of games. Do you work in Unity? Well, that's predictable. Um, do you work in a team? Yes. Uh, how big is the team? Uh, depending on the game, between two and five. Does anyone have any actual questions? That was time for you to Yes, George. Do we? How do we know that you're not? Well, <laughs> well, you see, I'm pretty good friends with Pat Ash, but if, if, if I don't say so, but, uh, yeah, well, he seems a very trustworthy person. Like, he's about he's not, he lies things. about things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, the thing about Pat Ash is built on a series of lies. Is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm saying that he's lying about that. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if he's lied about everything, but he's certainly lied about me being an actor employed by him. That doesn't make any sense. I thought we'd put that to bed. But, um, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, I know I've started a kind of story, but there's a lot of stories in there. Like, the real question is, do you think it's hard to make a game that is not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to make a game that is not uh, like a public thing. He cleverly linked to a point I put up earlier in the talk, which was about gameplay versus kind of narrative. And so it was just about how, how do you make a game that's not kind of combat based or based around competitiveness. So I say that kind of links back to the artistic process of any any medium basically, which is is if you've got a story to tell or, or you want to say something and you it kind of begin, I'd say it probably begins with writing or, or a kind of design idea that revolves around something that's not inherently kind of traditionally gamey. Uh, I know that we've been working with a lot of preconceptions about different kinds of games, about, about games for a while, and now it seems like every game is already based within a certain kind of set of parameters, like RTS, like first person shooter, like online multiplayer, team based shooter. And it's about trying to find something outside of that. Like one principle we had in the Stanley Parable was if we didn't understand how an idea would translate into the game, that was a sign that it was worth exploring at least. Yes? Um, Stanley Parable was, a very, was exploring very uh, certain kinds of ideas and the whole game world was um, like built around those ideas. What can you take uh, out from Stanley Parable? What have you learned from that game? And what do you think, what, which design ideas can you take out into other games that are not specifically built around this kind of concept? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose narratively, the, what it was about for me was about the player being inside a set of systems and a structure, and then trying to figure out what that structure was based on the rules that they saw in play, and they had to kind of figure out how it was all working. Uh, one of, I, I'd say that probably the best design decision we made in the Stanley Parable was to remove the kick back to the menu screen after each ending, which was in the mod, but it wasn't in the main game. And what that creates is a sense of a whole big cohesive structure that is, that it feels like one big game. Rather than a selection of endings, it becomes more than the sum of its parts. When you add into that the notion of randomization, people, the human brain naturally wants to create kind of links, and that combined with the narrative idea of the player trying to understand the system that they're in and the rules that govern the narrator and the office and Stanley, uh, it, becomes, it, it then becomes them trying to figure out this big puzzle when some of the puzzle pieces are just completely random and aren't tied to anything that the player is doing. So I'd say that uh, a good amount of randomization, uh, if you shove a lot of secrets in, then players are bound, to are bound to find some. If you put in 200 secrets, players will likely find about 100 in the course of their just play through the game because people are naturally inquisitive. And, um, but if you only put like 20 secrets in that are well hidden and like full of content, then players will only see like 10. So I'd say put a lot of little details into your game in the polish phase that players can just find, like papers on the floor with text on them, or, or little um, quirks that the characters might say if you interact with an object in a specific way. And you can feed that back from playtesting. When you see playtesters play your game, they might just inherently do a weird thing. Don't try and patch that out or coat or, or, or soften the edges on that. Um, have that link to 
something that rewards the player for being kind of naturally inquisitive. So, uh, yes. Um, ba -ba 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 yes. Thank you. Um, did you have any uh, early development versions of Standard Parable that were very different, or was it really going towards what it is at the end? The, uh, well, there was the initial mod version, which was pretty much just the core basic uh, layout, and when you finished that ending, it boot, booted you back to the start, to the menu screen, and you press play the game again. Uh, we, the development process of the remake, which, was, which went on to be sold, that was a two-year process, and we actually submitted it. I don't think this is public knowledge, so I'm going to lift the veil a bit. We, um, we submitted that to IGF the first year, and it didn't get anything. Oh no, it got some, it got some honorable mentions, but that was a very different um, version of the game. It was, it was still booting you back to the menu after each, uh, after each game thing, so it was then, it then became, it then came, became like a, kind of fine, all the endings game, and it got very kind of, okay, if I took the left door, then I need to take the right door, and then go downstairs, and then I get new content. And we had a big, uh, we, we had a big discussion, I was about to say argument, but no, we were talking this through, about, <laughs> um, about how to best solve the problem of, oh god, the player is going to be playing a portion of the game about nine times throughout the course of the game, and it's just going to become mind-numbingly boring. Now we had some ideas like, okay, we could add a save system, which is lame and we shouldn't, we don't do that. It's a terrible idea because it, it becomes then a really technical process of clicking save and then loading in, and it's making the player do lots of work to just skip out on bits they've already seen, so that was not an option. Another option was we just speed things a lot. When the player restarts, they start at two doors, but that doesn't really solve the problem. That's kind of like a little band-aid on, on a problem. You want something that will galvanize the wound, to say. The wound of the problem is a metaphor. Um, <laughs> so I'd say, I'd say that um, the, the solution we came to was that in the bit that the player would play again, we made that inherently what the whole game was about, the notion of repetition, and we change it every time the player went through that. And so we could then start to play with the notion of the game creating like terminology or, or mo motifs and start to play with those motifs, like the opening office section, there'd be loads of different variations on that. Some which would link into the ending that you just previously played, and that would then really mesh it all together and make it one big experience rather than lots of tiny little experiences. Um, do we have any? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that I'm, I'm surprised no one's asked about is how did you manage to work with someone for two years in a different time zone without ever? Without it, ever it was very difficult. Um, not to sound kind of glib or anything, it, it has affected me in very different, negative, several negative ways in the sense that to shift your time zone for such a long period of time is really not healthy at all and it, it does kind of mess up your life a bit. I was very lucky because I'm, I'm like not old and like all of you and um, I was still able to be supported by my parents through that. I worked half time, I, I worked part time on it through the first year and I was still in college and then I dropped out of art school to um, do the last, uh, the last year of development full time. Um, but it's, it's difficult. I know that we, we, I suppose a big part of it is if you like the people you're working with that makes everything easier. Uh, we spent about three hours a day just talking over Skype, working out design issues, showing each other what we've been working on that day and just critiquing it. And that process, when, you, when you're kind of working with a writer and a designer, often games are either inspired by the writing, like uh, I suppose um, Dear Esther. And uh, so the writing comes first and then the design naturally follows. So how do we tell that story through games? Or it's, it's design focused, like, um, like on home actually, which you wouldn't expect because it's a story based game. But it, the design came first, the limitations of working uh, in unity with a small team to tell a story. That design came first and then they figured out what kind of story they could tell with that. Standard Parable is really weird because the narrative and the design 
happen concurrently because Davey primarily being a writer and me a designer, we'd talk a lot and we'd show each other everything and like my design would be uh, informed by his writing and then his writing would be informed by the level design and the and the design of the kind of structure of the thing. And 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 that kind of created a stepping stony hand pile kind of thing. Uh, yes. Uh, do you have any practical tips on working remotely for such a long time with someone? I mean do you use Skype? Or what other tools do you use to share information? Uh, boring tools, stuff like Dropbox, you use Dropbox for everything. We managed to not use Pro for the entire, the, the, the premium version of Dropbox. <laughs> and that was hard to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, Skyping, I'd say working out a time to Skype. I think it's just part, part of it was I had the luxury to be able to give most of my time to it. And we could just find times to just chat. He, you know, if you always have your phone on you with the Skype on, and always make it a priority to answer when the other person's calling, just constantly kind of stay in touch, shove stuff you're doing on Dropbox, and don't feel like you have to rush the things. I know. I'd say that with Stanley Parable, we didn't understand what we were making until about three months before we shipped it. We kind of had an idea, we knew we were piecing contents in, but it all kind of clicked into, the, into place when we, had, um, when we had the last bit design about it becoming a whole big piece. And that's when we started to understand, and that's when we were doing crunch. And I think the notion that we had the core structure of the game down pretty early, and then it was all just iteration. We iterated, we iterated the game completely about three times through the course of development. And each time we thought it was going to be the last. But uh, I'd say that's just that teaches you more about the thing that you're making. Don't think that you understand what you're making because you, you probably don't. <laughs> it's like it's the whole weird, messy process of turning an idea into a product. You're, you, the pro, the, what you're making changes along the way because you learn about it because you're spending so much time with it. So I know a lot of people, I think that's probably a weakness with larger teams and bigger budgets because they need essentially to stick to a plan to create a product at the end of it. And I think maybe when you're making something artistic uh, with a smaller team and, and the ability to take risks, you can kind of let the process inform your decisions rather than needing to have a plan that structures everything so you can get a commercial product. Yeah.